Wow. Okay. That's all over the place. Hi, this is Jeff Marsacci, the Plain English Attorney, and strap yourself in because you're probably going to get whiplash if you don't. This video is going to be a bit of a doozy. Uh, we're talking about a thread on Reddit r slash estate planning about a Schedule A being missing from the trust. And what does this mean? And we're going all over the place because there are attorneys from all these different states chiming in. So let's go ahead and we'll jump into it. My grandpa's trust is only missing the Schedule A portion of the trust. My grandpa's trust is only missing the Schedule A section of the trust. In all reality, there was nothing probably listed in the Schedule A. All his real property were in trust with a trustee listed. All his bank accounts had beneficiaries listed except two. Knowing my grandpa, I think he just overlooked those bank accounts. I know they weren't intended to be something special to be listed on the Schedule A. With the Schedule A missing, is the trust still valid? Since those accounts are barely over the small estate requirement in California, does it look like the state will require full probate? Or just an 850 petition would work? He had a pour over will that put everything not specific in the trust back into the trust. Everything was taken out of the trust binder and mixed up. I had to fix the order. It was messy. I'm just wondering how strongly I need to search for the Schedule A file through my grandpa's stuff. It's a difference between a couple of thousand for an 850 petition or 30,000 for full probate. Wow. Okay. That's all over the place. And this kind of also gets to one point of just keeping your records straight. Uh, keeping everything in one binder, keeping it in order, not pulling pages out, adding stuff here and there. And it, when you're that disorganized, even with the best plan, if your trustee can't find it in an easy to manage situation in a binder and they have to go search for stuff, it's still going to be potentially a headache and a mess and a pain. If you think it's important for educational videos like this to get out there, then please help us out by subscribing to the channel. And when you're using a revocable living trust to avoid probate, probate, what you're really doing is you're trying to avoid problems. You're trying to avoid complications. That's it at a basic plain English level. You don't want hassles for your loved ones when you're not here. So and this actually reminds me of a case where I had a gentleman came in with a trust. It wasn't one of our trusts. And it, yeah, my father just died. Here's the trust. Here's the First Amendment to the trust. Here's the Third Amendment to the trust. Well, wait a minute. Where's the Second Amendment to the trust? Oh, I don't know. I can't find it. Well, for all we know, that could have disinherited a bunch of people, gave some, gave a couple of hundred thousand dollars to here or there. We didn't know. So he had to go searching and looking for it. And a couple of weeks later, he found it. It's a little two-page amendment with a big coffee ring stain on it. Apparently he put his coffee on top of it, the original amendment to the trust signed and everything. And then it ended up getting stuck to the bottom of a stock prospectus and he found it in the bottom of a desk drawer. Well, thankfully it didn't do too much, but look, when it was that disorganized, it really did create a bunch of panic. Uh, you know, this is also one reason why we really don't like doing amendments as opposed to just printing out the whole trust document again with the updated changes so it's an amendment and restatement. Because you get a nice, good, solid, thick trust, it's not going to get missed because it got stuck to the bottom of a stock prospectus. All right, so let's jump in for a few more things here. If the accounts exceed the small estate affidavit, 166,250, then you're doing full probate without the schedule. And anyone who quotes you $30,000 for probate on an estate barely cover the, the small 
estate amount is ripping you off. An estate worth 200000 should cost 7000 attorney's fee. 7000 executor fee can be waived by the executor and maybe two to 3000 in other fees, probably less than 2000 If you don't need a probate referee, so nine to 17000 tops, it's still more than what a Hegstead will cost, but not $30,000 worth. Call the lawyer who drafted the docs. Maybe they have a copy. I keep a scan of the executed docs in my office. I am a California estate planning and probate attorney in LA. Okay. A Hegstead petition. In other words, I'm going to explain it and someone else explains it a little bit later, so we'll gloss it over at that point. A Hegstead petition is if you have a Schedule A and it lists this type of property to be part of the trust, but you never actually get around to changing title, well, you can go to court and a judge can say it's part of the trust. Let me say that again. You can go to court. The whole purpose of a revocable living trust too is, is to avoid probate by funding the trust. And now I'm going to do a, a shameless plug. I've got my trust funding course. I'm going to put the uh, the address there. Please fund your trusts. I can't tell you how frustrating it ends up being for my clients' families if their loved one went through the trouble of getting together a great revocable living trust initially puts all their assets in, or maybe they don't put all of them in, but then they find out a whole bunch of things end up in probate that could have gone into the trust. We're not talking like refund checks or smaller items or whatever. We're talking big accounts that they just didn't bother. Uh, but notice they're talking about going to court using this petition because apparently this happened so much that California had a case that look if you've declared it as part of it even if you don't change the title on it in california you can still bring it into the trust but you have to go to court to do it so let's check some of the other things you probably never filled it out most people don't fill it out and even when they do it's usually a bunch of personal stuff true I think so too. I'm wondering if it not being in the trust will play a role in the court saying we have to go through the full probate process rather than a Hegstead petition, which is much more reasonable considering there is a pour over will. Yes, if you never place the assets in trust or put beneficiary designations or other probate avoiding transfers, then they are probate assets. All right. That brings me back to something that was mentioned earlier and just alluded to there. He had accounts that had pay on death beneficiaries that weren't the trust. Why would you do that? Why on earth would you put together a revocable living trust and have bank accounts go somewhere other than being in the trust? I mean, I could see if it's IRAs and 401ks because there's a tax reason for it, but not like bank accounts and stock accounts. That just doesn't make any sense. All right, let's go back. Uh, asking this question for California attorneys, but I think it might help you in California with the existence of Schedule A, uh, which, you know, IDs bank accounts whose institution does not independently reflect the asset was transferred to and owned by the trust, have any legal impact. In my state, it definitely would not, as the account itself had to be formally retitled. A general assignment on Schedule A would not have been sufficient. And that is exactly the case in my state and most others. I think this is just a kind of a California thing, a Hegstead petition that basically says, yeah, they screwed up by not putting it in the trust. But they said in the Schedule A they wanted it to be. Well, okay, go to court, file the petitions, and we'll have a whole proceeding. And yeah, it's going to cost thousands of dollars. Well, why not just retitle it in the name of the trust? Uh it does have a legal impact in California as OP implied presence of an... Okay, so yeah, uh, it's, it's a California thing. Totally, the conditions and allegations required for a successful petition are, of course, a little bit more complex, but that is the gist. So yeah, it's more complicated 
and it has to be specific and it has to be done right, meaning you've got to go to an attorney. So maybe it's probate light, but still, it's like, I mean, it's a court proceeding. We don't want that if we don't have to. But it wouldn't invalidate the trust to not have a Schedule A correct. It would just mean you have to deal with probate for those two accounts. That's right. A Schedule A typically not even part of the notarized trust and is definitely not a requirement for the trust to be effective, assuming assets are, in fact, titled to the trust. The primary purpose of the Schedule A is just to serve as a roadmap for successor trustees to follow so that all the settlers' assets get accounted for. All right, let me talk a little bit about that in the way I've always seen the Schedule A that they seem to be referring to, how that works. It's just a declaration of what's in the trust. And so you just put this very broad description. And really the point was, it used to be, well, you can't have a revocable trust without assets in the trust. So you declare all this stuff is part of the trust. That's the way it is in most of the states that I've seen. Again, I can only speak to North Carolina. But apparently it means more in California alone. But again, fund the trust so you don't have these issues. Not a California t attorney, but we deal with a lot of California crossover work. And by we, I mean the Arizona bar. The answer is, as far as I, I know, is no. And I believe it's the same answer in all states. Regardless, it would be a pretty uphill battle to get the bank to transfer the account over without probate. The one account I do recall us talking about is a decedent had executed a writing transferring the real property to the trust. The consensus was that the writing satisfied, by, satisfied the statute, but nevertheless... They had to go to court to effectuate the transfer as it was never recorded. The second consensus was that the probate court was probably the easiest route. Okay, when probate is the easiest route, you know it's way more complicated than it needs to be. Okay, that absolutely tracks with my experience in my home state, including what limited experience I have, i.e. seen others do. In California, thanks for the insight. Yes, it will. If you have a document that shows grantor's intent to put it in trust, but for whatever reason it was not, then you can file a Hegstead petition, probate code section 850, and get it put in the trust. It takes longer to get access in LA County. Courts are slow, but the cost is cheaper. You have to have proof of clear intent, though. The court expanded the Hegstead rule in Uxted, saying that the trust deck. <laughs> Code talking. According to such and such case and such, for, for gosh sakes, just fund your trust. Why would you rely on a court proceeding when the purpose of a revocable living trust is to avoid probate? Okay, so well, for that much difference, I would keep looking for a few hours. Otherwise, you and everybody else involved might probably have to assume that the Schedule A was never filled out. The trust is still valid, probably. You need a lawyer to go over the exact language of the trust. And all right, that's just kind of CYA language. It's their right to say, yeah, you need to have an attorney actually give you a legal opinion whether the trust is valid. Because if they said it's valid... And yet there was maybe a signature page missing and the court would throw it out. But this attorney said it was valid. No, no you, you want it checked out. But by and large, just missing the Schedule A, as another person pointed out, another lawyer, it's not even typically part of the, uh, the, no, you know, the signature and notarized portion. It's just kind of attached. All right. It would be better if the bank records listed the account as belonging to the trust. In other words, the trust was funded. Otherwise, you get into the situation where the account belongs to the estate, which then pours it over to the trust. I would expect that for the accounts with listed beneficiaries, the estate and trust never get their hands on those accounts. They go directly to the beneficiaries. Again, why do you have a revocable trust and have this go somewhere else? Again, unless it's tax-deferred money. 
Schedule A is more for specific bequests, like a fishing boat, season tickets to the Packers, his favorite Sunday suit, LOL, you get the picture. You see, Schedule A means a ton of different things because it's not some official document. It doesn't really have a meaning, the Schedule A. You could list everything that they've been talking about that, oh, the Hegstead petition and whatever that's in Schedule A, that could have been in a Schedule B. And me say, Schedule B, that's for listing charities. Well, because it is in our trust that we do. But look, it, do it doesn't matter. It's what is it supposed to do? But again, it's all over the place because Schedule A is meaning different things to different attorneys in different states. Uh, it's not needed for a trust to be valid. Only the signature page is needed. If pages between the first page and the signature page are missing, then that's a dispute within the family as to who the beneficiaries are, etc. This could be a problem. However, attorneys keep files of old trust docs prepared. Depending what year it was drafted, try contacting the office that prepped the trust and request a copy. If that's not possible, don't worry. The big thing is knowing who your grandpa appointed as successor trustee. They have all the power to administer the trust. Do they? Did you, did, did, this attorney didn't check the actual trust to see exactly what kind of powers they have to fill things in. We don't know if they do. Uh, also, if assets of his were held in the trust, a.k.a. bank accounts, there is no reason to even think about probate. Well, that's true. Check the accounts. Are they titled in his individual name or in the name of the trust? Again, basics. Was it funded? IRA, retirement accounts, and life insurance are the only assets not able to be held in trust, but distributed based on the beneficiary designations. Those are not subject to probate either. The two loose bank accounts are entitled to his personal name, no beneficiary listed, and those two accounts are each over the small estate minimum. I'm just assuming the pour over will will suffice or would suffice. Again, it's getting down to that Hegstead petition. Just fund your trust. Look, I'm also going to put a link to the free trust funding webinar in here. Uh, so go ahead, sign up for that, check that out. If you've got a revocable living trust, if you took the time and expense to put together a good one, why wouldn't you fund it and keep on top of it? I always ask my clients every year we need, should be sitting down to do an annual review meeting. It's not so much about changes in the law or these big, huge tax changes or they're going to have changes to their documents every year. They might. And going through that stuff is important. But on average, my clients only make changes about every five to seven years. But that meeting is important because we stay on top of their trust assets to make sure they're still funding their trust properly. If they go six, seven years without seeing us and pass on maybe somewhere between a quarter and a third or more of their assets went to other financial institutions and end up title in their name and having to go through probate. All right, so I hope you found that information useful. Please go ahead and check out the free webinar on funding your revocable living trust. I think it would be very helpful to see the, the fails there. And then we also have our trust funding course. So as I always tell my clients, please stay safe, plan ahead and enjoy life. And whatever you do, make it a great day.